Thank you for allowing me to do the talk because um, I, you know, I, I am passionate about this topic. Um, it was interesting to see on um, who do you think you are last night that um, um, what's his name, <laughs> David Williams, uh, he had an ancestor who was at a, a hospital in the First World War. I've done lots of First World War talks and sometimes they can get a bit, de bit depressing because you end up with people dying. And this is a nice talk in a way because um, yes, people do die, but not many of them, you know, uh, majority, the vast majority of them, I think something like 31 of the 435 patients um, died. So 31 out of 435. And that's not because of um, Harterbury, it's because of the fact that they go back to fight in the, in the war and then die as a result of that. Um, if I explain, I was a, a, a history teacher at a, a secondary school in Birmingham teaching 11 to 18, it was a comprehensive, so it was all, all ages, um, good classes and bad classes, you know, so on the chalk face. Um, I went, and I'm pretty sure like most teachers, when I started teaching, I thought, ah, you know, I'm not really a teacher. I'm a history, I'm a historian really. And the teaching just pays the bills. And then what happens is you get sucked into the darn thing. I found I was good at it and, um, History, history was uh, fulfilled because I was teaching A-level and, and GCSE and I would spend four nights a week uh, during the week doing lessons and then one, one night in, at the weekend doing lessons. And it, it gave very little, and then we had children, you know, very little time for anything else. So then I retire and I wasn't looking for it, but books began to hit me. I, I did a research on a, a war memorial and National Express then published it. So I was into writing books. And then I was doing, a, I was still, though I was retired, I was still working with my school. Um, and we got involved with a project looking at the wounded in Birmingham in the First World War. And I saw that um, there was a, a course going on at um, Worcester, at the, uh, the old infirmary at the university. And um, it, they, they, they asked uh, for obviously people to go and I was working with uh, a colleague in Birmingham who I thought ought to go um, and she wasn't able to go and I said well okay I'll, I'll go so I went and found myself in the Mid Midlands Women's History Forum so I looked a bit out of place um, because you know as, as a man uh, there were other men there but you know, I, it just seemed a bit. It, it, it was something I, I thought maybe I shouldn't really be here, but I was going to collect information. Then what happened was that we got to the the dinner time, and it was our whole day conference. And, of, and often, if you go on these things, you come, you're concentrating on what are we going to have to eat for dinner. And this lady stood up and told us about Hartbury Castle Hospital and how um, it was the home. The, the castle was the home of the Bishop of Worcester. Um, it had then been taken over by Worcester uh, City, um, who had decided, and then they, they created the, um, the, the county museum there. And then they decided that what they were going to do was, um, well, possibly they couldn't look after it anymore. They maybe put the castle up for sale. And what happened was that the village took over the castle and they set up a trust and it's run as a charity. They'd opened a drawer and then the history teacher's dream, the absolute dream, in the drawer, they found three books uh, that had been looked at in the past, but probably forgotten. And these books were the business books uh, from the castle, from the, the castle when it was a hospital. Now, we drive quite often past uh, Barnsley Hall, where you got the house in the state. And it's so sad in the way that all the all the, um, well, the vast majority of the records of the work done in these VAD hospitals disappeared. So you can find hospital records often, as they did on Who Do You Think You Are? Um, but it's very difficult to find what went on in the VAD hospitals. Um, the records must be there somewhere. And what these records were, belonged to the lady at the top of the picture there. Um, 
she's called Frances Gibbons, and she'd collected um, uh, these autograph books, which the soldiers wrote in when they stayed in the hospital. And the lady at, uh, going back to the talk, the lady was um, asking for someone to do the research. And I thought, it's not your place, Doug. You're a busy man. Don't do it. And as my friend Gal, who's on this uh, talk tonight, would, would confirm, I very rarely, I can't find it in my heart to say no. And I saw that um, nobody was talking to her, at the pull of the sandwiches talking to her. So I went and spoke to her. And uh, I said, Is anybody, did anybody say they're going to do the, do the research? No. I said, well, I'm very busy, but I'll do the research. And what then transpired was that these books were wonderful. They were full of old photographs, um, annotated sometimes, sometimes not annotated. When, doing, when I was doing the research, I found there were another four books belonging to the lady at the, um, in the top right, who is Laura Stocks, who is a nurse at the hospital. And what I then had to do was what you do when you know someone's died often and you end up with their photographs, but you've got two sets of photographs, two groups of photographs. I had to put all these photographs together and make some sense of them. And what came out of it was um, the story of 435 patients that I could, oh sorry, it's, it's 430, yeah, 435 patients. Um, there's 20 nurses, 102 different um, regiments, uh, the 60, 650 different photographs in the book. There's artwork, there's poetry, um, there's bits about the person's life. And when it's when I come to doing a talk like this, it is sad because I know what I'm missing out. Um, you know, it is very difficult to be able to do things, um, you know, in a 45, 50 minute slot when really the book is, is a wonderful book. I can go backwards just slightly there. Can go backwards, can I go backwards? Why is it called Cheers? Cheer boys, it's hard. Cheer, well, it's Cheer boys, it's hard. If you look at the cartoon on the left, um, it was drawn by Roberto Robottom. Well, you know, great name, Roberto Robottom. And if you look, he's put Cheer Boys, it's Hartbury, and he's got a patient in the hospital blue uniform that the patients had to wear. And basically, you know, it's saying, um, don't worry, you're going to Hartbury. Hartbury is great. You know, Hartbury is a, a wonderful place to come to. So it's Cheer Boys, it's Hartbury. And um, the title of the book has got an exclamation mark. Roberto didn't put the exclamation mark, but the, the publishers won over and they put the exclamation mark. Um, then this is the, in the Naked Publicity. The book's 1495, and there's another one called Who's for the Game. Uh, it's about those four uh, Birmingham uh, sports clubs. This is Worcester V18 uh, to eight to, today. Uh, and it's rough, it's the entrance uh, that you go to if, if, if the castle was open, so you can get inside the castle, so it's a visitor's entrance. Um, the castle, the, well, the, um, the, where the hospital was, was, was an old stable block that had been converted. It was owned by the, bush, the Bishop of Worcester, the, and I, don't, I, I won't try and, I won't embarrass myself by trying to say his proper name, but his, his, his surname's Yankman B Biggs. And he was 105th Bishop of Worcester, and he gave it to uh, the War Office for use as a hospital. At the start, uh, in 1906, uh, the Liberal government, or the Liberal Party, came to power in what was a landslide. And uh, this character, Richard Haldane, was appointed Minister of War. Now, just before that, there'd been a a crisis called the Tangier crisis, where Britain had almost gone to war with Germany. And so the Liberal government, which was the least militaristic of the, of the two parties, found itself in a situation where it had to prepare for war, even though, you know, because war might occur. So Haldane is appointed Minister of War. And one thing that became obvious to him was that the, the inadequacy of the British standing army. And so he created a territorial force of uh, part-time soldiers. 
on top of that, he also created a, um, a territorial force of nurses because, um, you know, unlike the, the, um, the myth that it was going to be over by Christmas, even at that point, they realized that um, it was the, the, whatever war occurred was going to co cause huge casualties and the present system wouldn't be able to cope with it. Um, and he started um, a system where you get the, uh, the Red Cross and the St. John's Ambulance uh, people joining together uh, to form these voluntary aid detachments. Um, the uniform of the, the nurses, the Sister Dora hat is um, a nod to our uh, dear friend Sister Dora from Walsall. Uh, Sister Victoria Collap, don't know. Uh, blue dress for the, uh, the nurses, red for commandant. Commandment, can, commandants, uh, the Red Cross emblem, and the white uh, apron and white sleeve coverings. Uh, the first hospital at Hartsbury, um, if you can imagine, uh, the, the war by 1915 was going badly. Uh, the, uh, the idea that it would be over by Christmas, if there was an idea like that, it had certainly gone. And um, as a result of that, uh, the hospital wasn't quite ready. Um, a person from Chasley Corbett, where is, which is where I am now, gave the Woodlands as the first hospital. And you can see the patients here. Um, there'd probably be, be about 16 patients. At the front there, the dog's quite important. It's, it's called Wisp. And you find dogs appearing quite often. And you can see with these patients, you can see the wounds they've got that have come through um, the uh, probably the first bat, the second battle of Ypres in the early in early 1915. Uh, where these red poppies are appearing, what was what was Hartbury trying to do? Well, Hartbury was trying to convalesce the, the the soldiers, but essentially get them back into as fighting fit to fight in the war. Um, didn't always happen. But uh, in most cases, they, they managed to do it. And these five guys uh, eventually die in the war. So they, they go back to fight and then they die in the war. Um, this character, I won't read out the thing there, but it does show you the, the sort of things that were uh, could occur to the person. It tells you where he was wounded um, and his route to Hartsbury goes the first uh, Southern General in, in Birmingham, then comes to, um, has an operation taking bullet out of his thigh, and he spends about five weeks in Hartsbury. And he's one of the guys that later dies. So if I just get, just get. The road to Hartsbury. How did they get to Hartsbury? Well, this again staggers me. Um, you, if you can imagine the person that's injured, uh, on the Western Front or later Gallipoli. I mean, Gallipoli, how they got them from Gallipoli, you know, incredible. Um, if they were in, injured on the Western Front, this would be roughly the route they'd take. Uh, if, if they were too badly injured to walk, they'd be taken by stretching bearers to the regimental aid post or perhaps helped by someone to, to the regimental aid post. This is very close to the front. Then they go to a, a, a casually clearing station uh, where they're patched up. If at that stage uh, they, they can't do anything with them, they're then taken by ambulance. So all of this is close to the front. Then they're taken by ambulance uh, without proper suspension. So if you can imagine what that would be like. Um, they'd be taken to a base hospital. <clears throat> and the base hospitals, they might go to an early hospital, but the base hospital was away from the front. Um, and if they could be made better at that stage, they'd be sent back to their units. But if they couldn't, they were then sent by ship. What happened later in the war was that uh, when you get to the sum, the, the amount of casualties that were occurring meant often they would skip the base hospital and send them straight um, to uh, the, the, the ports like La Havre, etc., and then back to Britain. So from the base hospital, they'd go on a ship, uh, which is clearly marked with the Red Cross. And at the start of the war, um, you couldn't attack a Red Cross ship later in the war, a number of these ships were sunk, you know, so even getting onto the ship would be difficult. But once you're on that ship, you're not even safe at that point later in the war. And then um, if I come down to the next slide. 
sorry, there's, I'm, I'm working with a, with, a, with a mouse and the mouse is very temperamental. Okay, they would arrive at Southampton <coughs> and they'd be taken off the train at Southampton. Oh, sorry, they'd taken off the boat at Southampton and then they'd be put on a train um, this is a train that's been converted for um, uh, stretcher cases for the wounded. And you see there's three beds there, one on top of the other, um, with a bell nearby. And it looks like a fan there too. So they can, uh, you know, uh, one of these, presumably somebody would ring a bell or whatever. I can't imagine the patients doing it if there's a problem. Um, then you can imagine once they're on that train, oh, sorry, if you go back to Southampton, um, why why did they send the, the patients to a particular hospital i'm pretty sure it was a job's worth i'm pretty sure it was a case of they had a docket and they went down the list and they said where have we got spaces oh this train's going to birmingham let's put them on that train so it depends on what trains were in so that's why the patients um would end up at somewhere like um uh, uh, birmingham when their home uh, city was perhaps um, newcastle so just depending on where you got a train, where you got um, spaces. And the first job in Southern General, as you probably will hopefully will recognize, it's the Great Hall at uh, Birmingham University. So the, the, um, Birmingham University had only recently been built and was already designated as a hospital. And this was the major hospital for the, for the whole area. You get offshoots from it eventually, but uh, it was the main hospital. Um, Interestingly, the if you, this with, from this postcard from the time, uh, uh, the Wordsley Hospital in, in in Stourbridge is also classed as a first Southern General, <clears throat> and I think what this means is that it was under the auspices of Birmingham University's hospital, and this is where so our patients would either go to uh, Birmingham or they'd come here, and then they'd have proper medical treatment. When they had the proper medical treatment, when they had the operations, etc., they would then take uh, an ambulance journey to Hartlebury. This is an original photograph from the albums, and again, you can see there's uh, like double-decker stretches either side um, with fairly basic trucks. Um, this the guy on the stretcher. I know he's a man called Wood, and he's been brought up the stretcher. You see the boots there and the other soldier, and um, so this is arriving at Hartlebury. The staff at Hartlebury, uh, the, the nurses came from a variety of different backgrounds. Some of them were ladies of leisure, I put it that way. Um, some were the servants of the ladies of leisure. Um, some were perhaps unmarried daughters. Um, some were just people who wanted to do their bit. Now, wearing the Red Cross of, uh, of, of the Red Cross Society, apart from the lady that's next to the doctor, who isn't and she, that's because she was trained as a proper nurse and also the one in the background there who is the is classed as the superintendent she's a visitor to the hospital how the hospital was set was set up uh, the commandant was in charge of the hospital so he had one commandant uh, the medical person was the matron or the sister then you had a quartermaster uh, who looked uh, as we know looked after the stores uh, and then obviously you'd have the nurses who did general duties. This is our commandant, uh, Frances Gibbons. Um, she was the, the daughter of Benjamin Gibbons, uh, who was, uh, or the Reverend ben Benjamin Gib Gib Gibbons, who came from Starport. Um, she had a sister had inherited property in London and uh, when the father had died, they bought a house in Hartlebury uh, called the plaque and the plaque is where the the patients later it was used as an, an overspill place for the patients um, the driving force the hospital was margaret gibbons because margaret gibbons uh, as i say was medically trained um, she'd served from 1914 in france and in belgium and she's on the left here and when you see that um, she's on the left of the screen um, and she was there until October of 1915 when she comes to Hartlebury. So she did have medical training. Um, so she then came to Hartlebury and you can see that 
I think she was quite stern because some of the poetry makes it sound as though she's quite stern, but I think she probably had a you know, heart of gold because here you can see um, she's playing bowls with the men. Um, I think they were going to play, as you'll see later, they, were, they often played bowls against Wilden, which was the local VAD hospital in Star, uh, Starport. And um, if they had a match, often they'd have a practice go before the, the Wilden patients arrived. Uh, and just because I think this is the only time we're going to use this photograph, uh, in the background, you can see there, this guy is an Australian. You know, so the people came from a long, long, long way away. Uh, the quartermaster, Annie Bradley, lived in Hartsbury. Uh, quartermaster had to deal with um, blankets and medical supplies, anything that was required for hospital. So it was an important person. Uh, the cook, nurse Ellen Maria Crump. And if ever a person deserves to be called Crump, if anybody's here is watching, is, is, whose surname is Crump, I do apologise, but she does look like a Crump. Um, and the spooky thing was it about it was that um, Janet, my wife Jan and I, we, we were at, uh, we went, I'd been working on this in the morning, and we went out for a cream tea in Cottonall Green, and we went to Lord Morton's in Cottonall Green, which you might know. And um, what was spooky about it was that only say pr probably an hour before, I checked on Nurse Ellen Maria Crump's address, and it was the post office, Cottonall Green which, and the post office caught the green, is Lord Morton's. So I was in the very place of the lady I'd just been looking up. So, you know, got great deal of respect for Maria Crump. You can see she's a little lady, but, you know, little lady with ferocious look in her face, tremendous. Uh, Laura, Laura Stocks. Um, again, you can see this, this, the stripes on the sleeves refer to the long service, so she'd served throughout the war. Um, Laura Stocks, it was her books. Her books, are, in fact, are better than the, um, the Commandant's books. I hope Miss Gibbons would forgive me for saying that. I think she probably got better photographic equipment. She's often using the Commandant's uh, photographs, but she's probably developing them in her own studio. Her dad was an analytical chemist, so I would imagine that was probably the case. Um, she li lived at um, Sneeds Green, uh, which is not far from Cotton Green. Um, she came from South Africa in 1914, so when the war started she was actually in South Africa and then came back and served throughout, uh, served at Hartsbury from its opening in the May of 1915 to its closure in the April of 1919. Uh, Nurse Joyce Amphlett, I've left on, uh, there's three different Amphlets and I know that um, my Bromsgrove people will probably recognise the name Amphlet. I'm not certain whether, because there's an Amphlet Hall, isn't there? And I'm not certain whether it's the same family. Um, <clears throat> she, uh, she was actually living at Acton Hall in Starport, although there was another sister living at Brockhampton, but I'm pretty sure there must be a connection uh, for the Amphlet in some way. Uh, I've just left this on because oh how much how I what which I wished last night that David Walliams said and my ancestor went to Hartsbury Hospital and then I would have sent him a copy of the book but no he didn't say it um, or you know Agatha Christie was a VAD nurse oh if only Agatha Christie worked at Hartsbury but no so the best I can do is Miss Mary Augusta Packington now the Packingtons were a very famous Worcester family uh, they lived at um, is it Westwood House. Uh, which has since been converted into flats. Um, and Mary Augusta Packington uh, was actually a playwright and an author that had things published in between the wars. So, you know, we don't know Mary Augusta Packington now, but she's my sole claim to being a, uh, an author uh, and a playwright. Oh, sorry. What earth did that do? Okay. Um, this isn't quite a claim to fame, but I loved, I, I loved Minnie Cer Cerrell's smile as soon as I saw it and then, then didn't think any more of it. And I put it on Twitter and I got Philip Cerrell contacting me because it's, you know, if you know Philip Cerrell, the auctioneer, uh, auctioneer who is on um, often bargain hunt and things like that. And this is one of his ancestors. So Minnie Cerrell's connected to him. But, you know, absolutely brilliant smile. There was a doctor, uh, Dr. Stanley Robinson, who came from Starport. Um, what was his role? Well, 
basically, if the patients were at heart to breathe, they shouldn't have required a great deal of medical attention. Um, so I think he was basically, he was keeping an eye on what was going on, making sure the patients were all right. I know for a fact that there's no records about the, the medical treatment, but you, um, I know the hospital would have had about 16 patients. And um, sometimes on the photographs, you don't get all 16 patients. You get perhaps 11, as you did at, um, in the first, in the, in the first um, photograph. So there must have been some patients that were in bed you know, too poorly to come down. So he'd be checking on those. And these are the patients. Um, I love the fact that here in the corner, we've got, uh, this is Scout, Scout de Ridder is his name. And he's, he's snuck in on the picture. So I don't know what the Scout's doing, but I hope he's doing a good job with them. Uh, and often this is taken outside the front of uh, what was the hospital. And you often get the patients here. What was the point of Hartenbury? Um, I On the publicity for this, I said it was um, it was an oasis of calm and, and mean carnage. And it was that, you know, when you think of what the, the soldiers were going through uh, and where they'd come from, um, they would have seen sights that, you know, I, I, I once knocked over a squirrel and it upset me the whole day because I killed a squirrel. I dread to think what some of these soldiers would have felt when they saw the carnage of the Western Front. Uh, you know, their, their friends blown to pieces. Um, the, the frosty conditions of uh, the winter of 1415, the feet frozen, to, frozen into blocks of ice. Um, what, what was hard to be trying to do? I said at the beginning, it was to, that what they were trying to do was to get them to a stage where they could go back to fight. Okay, this meant physically, get them physically able again, uh, mentally the same, you know, and that um, is a much more difficult job getting them mentally able. So what they did was to give them rest, relaxation, good food, comradeship, calm, um, and try and do anything to take their minds away from the fighting in the front. Um, here, they're playing tennis. Now, I don't know, the one guy you can see is a tall guy and he was a guardsman. Um, so maybe he played tennis before. Um, but again, they're playing here at the Plec and, you know, tennis would be uh, one way of doing it. Uh, this one, <laughs> crokery. It's called crokery because that's how um, one of the soldiers, when he wrote his letter to the commandant, commandant thanked her for uh, the, his care and attention and he said he'll miss the games of croquery they had. So, so here they're playing croquet on the lawn. And another one. I love the um, incidental, incidental background. So I've got Ombersley Court in the background. I've never seen Ombersley Court, but it looks a, an impressive building. Um, football match against the boys' grammar school. If you look carefully, you might see the, the, you know, the studied boots that the soldiers have got. Where did they get the boots from? Are they, you know, are they... Did the, the, um, I mean, grammar school provided with them the, with boots? Um, their uh, football gear looks more like um, long jumps, I think, than football gear. Um, and also, what a fine example for the for the uh, for the young boys! I, you know, look at them with the number of them are smoking. <laughs> you know, keep fit. Um, but obviously, if you're doing that, you're controlling your aggression. You know, it's back to what you know. Um, shooting another okay this is a good idea isn't it get them back to feeling normal again let's get them out shooting <laughs> um, and uh, Kimberly here is a sort of a local lad he's come from the black country um, and I'm sorry if there's any I can't, can't work it out whether they're pigeons or bunnies in the background I hope they're pigeons because you know if they're bunnies I really feel sad but he's gone out uh, shooting and he's killed a few things there um, but you can see again from his uh, the information he spent two weeks in hospital. Uh, he was uh, he came to Hartlebury and then he's transferred. And, and if you have if you've ever done any research uh, on uh, ancestors and First World War, and you wonder why they're in a particular um, regiment, sometimes it's because of the, the regiment that came uh, to their village, their town at that time recruiting. But often it's because they've been wounded before. So I think if you see a person that has been is has been in several regiments, it can be because they've been wounded, 
got better. And then when, when they've come back, it's another job's worth saying, OK, where should we send this one? Oh, we'll send him to such and such. So often you get a change of uh, regiment. So this guy, in fact, just changes his battalion. Uh, but you can see, again, he dies uh, because of his wounds on the 2nd of April 1918. But he's brought back to Britain. Now, this would have been in the... Uh, uh, what was called the German Spring Offensive in 1918. So he's brought back pretty quickly, but he's actually buried in this country. Um, I said about the Bowles Tournament, so this is the practice beforehand. And I say Wilden uh, was on the outskirts of Stourport. The hospital is long gone. Uh, Billy is another famous fa favourite sort of sport that was played um, with the cup. You can see that um, Artsbury were victorious yet again. Uh, the, the sack race, uh, the sack race, uh, the big guy in the, in the, uh, uh, the front there, I think in fact all three of those are Irish. And um, again, I feel very sorry for the Irish lads because um, if they were coming from Southern Ireland, they were, when they went back after the war, they were hated. You know, they were seen as traitors because they'd been fighting for Britain and, you know, Ireland was going through its independence. I love this one for the children on it because the children can be your children, my children. And you suddenly realize that though time separates us, people are very much the same. Um, there are many competitions against Wilton. Uh, this one, uh, again, the, the poppies show you the guys that went and, and eventually died back in, at the front. Um, these are fairly butch lads, aren't they, really? Some of them have come from back-to-back -back houses and what have you. Um, and yet, they here, they've, they've been given a, a straw hat, probably given a bunch of flowers and, and what else, and they've been asked to decorate the hat, and they've been judged on who has done the best cat decoration. One of them still smoking. Um, this is my, this is one of my favourites, the Wildham Gymkhana, 19th of August 1916, uh, at the cricket field at Wildham. Uh, it's got admission was sixpence, and then you've got motor cars and, and uh, other vehicles are extra. Um, if you look down the list, you've got uh, Francis Gibbons, except they spelled Francis wrong. It should be the E in there, so it should be Francis Gibbons. You've got uh, Herbert Whiteley, MP. Uh, you've got um, You've got uh, Philip Byrne Jones, who is, I think, related to the Baldwins. Um, you know, so some quite important people there. And then this is the race. And with the race, with the, the different races, um, there's a good explanation of what the races are. If we just pick a few of these, um, the cycling between pots is basically what it says it is. There's a, a course, and they put flower pots turned the other way up. And you have to cycle between them. And if you touch the pots, you have points taken off. Um, so I'd imagine the pots are quite close together. And obviously, it's the first one home. The Gretna Green race, which is number two. Uh, with this one, you have to have, it says a patient and nurse from all hospitals. And you can see they've got Meredith written there underneath it, which is probably in the commandant's hand. Uh, nurse Meredith was, a, was the, probably the, well, one of the youngest nurses I think it was game for anything, you know, she'd have a go at this. So what they had to do, uh, they both had to run as fast as they could go uh, to a given point. They had to sign their name uh, in, uh, on a piece of paper to say they were getting married. And then they had to go back arm in arm to, to where they'd started from. And they were judged on who was their fastest and whether they could read the signatures or not. Um, the bottle and the candle one, uh, which is number seven down here, uh, with, with this one, uh, I don't really fancy this one. They turn the bottle, so and then they'll ask you to sit on a bottle. Now, I hope it's got a really big neck because I wouldn't fancy sitting on a bottle. They sit on a bottle and they had to light a candle. And so it's whoever completed that one. Um, we, we can come down to the boat race, number 11. I can't quite reach with my mouse at the moment. But number 11, with a boat race, uh, you had a team of nine, essentially. You had eight men and a coxswain, and they had a pole between their legs. Oh, goodness. oh what, what could go wrong? Uh, and then they had to walk backwards. So it was the two teams against each other, like the boat race, walking backwards with a coxswain telling them which way to go. 
Uh, the Wisdom Race, which is number 14. Oh, another good one. Um, the soldiers had to run to a given point um, with an envelope, then open the envelope. Uh, oh, sorry, on the way they had to open the envelope. When they got to the, and then when they got to the given point, they had to whistle the tune to the waiting nurse, who then had to memorize the tune and then run all the way back to the starting point and then whistle the tune to the judges and say what the, what the, what it is. Um, <laughs> okay, again, big butch soldiers, although I think it's probably threading the needle isn't too bad a, a task to do. Often these involve running, but I think with this one, you had to run 15 yards, you had to sew a button onto something and then run back to the end and you were judged on how well you'd sewn the button on um, and who was quickest, etc. The hairdressing competition, you can see driving Tarplit, who I think is the, third, the second guy in, came second in this. You had some uh, willing young ladies who were, who were going to have the hair done. And they had, I think it was 15 minutes, roughly, uh, it was 15 minutes to uh, dress the ladies' hair. Uh, and again, I can see one guy smoking. Now, I don't, I don't know about you ladies, but I don't think I'd fancy my hair being dressed by some smoking. <laughs> um, and she looks like she's enjoying it. Um, at the end of it, oh yes, of course, you know, it's like the blues and the villa. Um, uh, we, we, uh, Hartsbury 176, you know, back of the net. Okay, let me come on to the art. Um, Henry Boot here, again, I wish I got more time to talk to you about Henry Boot. Henry Boot, um, you would think, where, where, where does somebody called Boot come from? Well, it could, it could have been Northampton with cobblers, but, it, but in fact, he came from Nottingham, which is the home of Boots. <clears throat> I don't think um, he's related to them because he's of very humble origins, um, but he, he was quite an artist. So he got this sort of watercolour here that he did, and there's quite a few drawings that he did. Uh, often what the soldiers would do is um, their regimental emblem, uh, which I think there's a copy of, of that. If you look on his uh, jacket here, you see he's in civilian clothes, but there is a silver war badge. And it was a bit like the white feather. You know, if you're in out of uniform, you could still be challenged as to why you weren't fighting. So what happened was when a person was invalided to such an extent that they couldn't go on fighting, they awarded them a silver war badge, which they'd wear, and then that would stop people making comments about them. Uh, I don't want to, okay, I'm not going to talk about Black's uniform at the moment, I've come, I've, although I might do. Um, he did this lady called the Lady in Blue. He won first prize for his Mr. Mistopheles outfit, and he left in December 1915. But I think, you know, there's quite, there's quite a bit of skill that's gone into his Lady in Blue. Uh, Chester Perry down here. Uh, you've, got, you've got gaze, HV gaze at the top there, but Chester Perry did these two. And Chester Perry uh, is from the Gloucester Regiment. And the sad thing about him is that he is the first person that is actually recorded as having died. Uh, Chester Perry was, a, he was a, a, a regular soldier, as most of these soldiers were, because it was too early in the war uh, for the volunteers to come through. He was a bugler, he was a young bugler before the war. He fought, he, he was a member of the Gloucester Regiment and um, he was killed. And, you know, you think about medals in wartime. Well, this guy spent two and a half hours in no man's land like, lighting smoke candles to, so that the Germans couldn't see what the, the British were doing behind their lines. And, and he was under, during that time, he was under constant fire. And you think, well, what does a guy have to do to get a medal? Because he, he then comes in, He's fine. The next day, um, he's killed by shell fire. Um, a sh um, they shell the, the British trenches and poor old Chester Perry is killed in the shell fire. I love the picture of the farmer. Again, it's, it's not brilliant artwork, but um, it maybe he's traced it, but it does show you, you know, life at the time. Um, this one is done by a guy called Emery. Uh, the first one, he didn't want to do it, so you you know you can see it, it's it tells you what it is in the picture in a way. He's got one, he's got he's lost his legs and he's lost one of the legs uh, in a drain. 
And the other one, I had to, I, I had to have this one explained to me. And it says uh, the CEO uh, says you're in line for a, uh, a VC. And the second time he was being half asleep, uh, thinks he means a CB. And I thought, what does a CB mean? It means confined to barracks. And he says, what have I done now? This is Emery that did the, the, the last drawings. And with him, what was his wound? He didn't have a wound. He got awful rheumatism, which is why he's in this sort of bath chair. And, you know, again, we tend to forget that um, war injuries um, could come in many, many different forms. Sometimes it was a bad knee, you know, because often they're moving heavy weights, bad backs, etc., cetera, are common. Um, Supper, Supper William MacDonald, again, you can see that he's one of these that dies. Um, and he's only 19. He took part in another football match. Um, and again, you can see, he's, bless him, he's smoking. Um, I just love the fact with this one, in his drawing, um, it's called, it's called his drawing, A Bolt for the Blue, but Mr. Phillips Hartabury. Now, this is probably the only drawing or uh, perhaps visual representation of Mr. Phillips, who's probably the policeman from Hartabury. Um, Roberto Robottom. If you know your military history, this uh, on his sleeve shows he's a second lieutenant. Now, it, in, the, in, in some ways, it is easier to find uh, officers, the records from officers, because they would often keep records. Um, and in some cases, people like Vera Britton um, or Agatha Christie were at that type of hospital. So they would be keeping, they would be writing about it themselves. Um, the officers would probably take more photographs. It is very rare to find photographs of um, ordinary soldiers. And all the hard to be soldiers are ordinary soldiers. Um, good old Roberto, he started off as a private in the Northumberland Regiment. Eventually, he rises to lieutenant. He was what, what was known as a temporary officer. But in fact, you know, I think Roberto Rob is, uh, Robotum is more than a temporary officer. He's a, you know, he's a, you can see he's a total gentleman, but he's also a great artist. And this is just a selection of what he did. Um, this one, as I said, is why the book is called Cheer Boys, It's Hartbury. Hospital Blues, poor, poor foot. Uh, Old Lang Syne. Uh, Robotum's best friend was Buckley. I'm pretty sure this is Buckley. Um, and then you've got this one here. When, when, you, when you come to the end of a perfect day and you've got the trophies of battle with a Scots guy looking on. Um, you, uh, they were often playing whist against uh, various, perhaps against uh, Wilden. And I'm pretty sure this, there's um, Robotum in the background and Buckley here, hearts and trumps. And Hardy, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm conscious of all the photographs there, all the drawings I could have put on. Hardy's one of the last ones, you can see it's 1919, and his, his cartoon's called Our Line is Tightly Held. They went on various trips. This one is to Horford Lock, uh, which if you know, it's on the Kidderminster, uh, Kidderminster Worcester Road. Uh, Westwood House, which is close to uh, Bromsgrove. And again, imagine the guys coming from back to back Birmingham, wherever, coming to these grand places. Now, would, I mean, I'm, I'm blown away sometimes when I go to stately homes, so I'm pretty sure they would have been totally blown away. And that's, that's Westwood House again, looking at it from a photograph that's in the books. Um, love Whitley Court. Um, this shows you Whitley Court uh, before the statues were taken away and sold off uh, with the, the gentry looking in the background here, the soldiers here. And you think, well, how did they get from Hartlebury to Whitley Court? That's quite a long journey. And you can see them, I don't know whether it's a horse and cart, whether it's a, a shower bang of sorts, it's something open topped. And these two, they've had a good day, <laughs> having a snooze uh, in the truck on the way home. River trips were quite common. Uh, this is uh, Sister Gibbons here. And, this, uh, with, and again, we've got some young people on the boat, probably down the River Severn. Uh, a lot of these are Scots, because he's a Scot, he's a Scot. And I think the guy at the end is a Scot. Cigarette again. I, th I think I'm right, they used to give cigarettes out for free to the soldiers. Uh, this, I love this one again, 
A, because it shows you the boat they would have gone on, the type of boat, uh, but it also shows you Worcester in the background. And you can see you know, how different the skyline of Worcester is now, although uh, the, this place here is still there. Uh, this one was identified last time I did a talk. I thought it was to do what was called a canal trip, but in fact, it's the back of uh, the Royal, of, of, King, of King's School in Worcester with the boys swimming in the water. It wasn't identified, so I don't know who did it, but I just liked it. Uh, they went, uh, the, the Baldwins lived at Astley Hall and the patients from Wilton and Hartsbury were invited to their silver weddings. They went to that. Uh, they went on a canal trip, and again, an unna unnamed artist, but you can see the horse pulling the canal boat, the barge. And then this one with the dog in the background. Um, and this is at Kinver. So, you know, I don't think it looks like, is it the vine at Kinver? It doesn't look like the vine, but it's somewhere at Kinver. Um, there were various trips to Worcester. This one on Worcester Bridge. Uh, this one, which you can see, is it's a postcard because it's got a signature at the bottom there. Uh, and again, with these warehouses here, which are now, I think, converted into flats. And you've got the assembled company. You can see, you know, the number of patients, etc. With this little one down here. Uh, and I've stood on this point and many a time. I walked past this point. You know, the, uh, you've got New Road Cricket uh, Ground just to my right and the bridge. And on November the 12th, the day after um, war, uh, the armistice, armistice was signed, they go to Worcester to celebrate. So Francis Gibbons there. And they've got two cards for them. Then we come on to the poetry. Um, and this is part of a much um, longer poem. And what a story they've got to tell back from that shrapnel zone of hell in a nice bled bed and plenty to eat. Oh, what a difference. Oh, what a treat. And when you get rid of your wounds and blisters, don't forget the kind nurses and sisters who nursed you and tried very hard with a tassel to keep you smiling in Hartsby Castle. And it's a, it's a beautiful poem because it, it, it tells you about life at the castle at the time. This one, um, I don't know where this original um, I'm pretty, I, I've never, if it isn't, if, if it's not original, I've never come across it before. It's called The Pilgrims of the Night. Again, it's quite a long poem, but you get the idea of what it is pretty quickly. It goes, there are families in dozens, uncles, mothers, sons and cousins, and they have their married quarters where they rear their sons and daughters, and they take a lot of catching, and they cause a lot of scratching. When you get enough to sleep, then they're forming up too deep. When you're in the land of Nod, then they're forming up in squad, and you find it most annoying when the sections are deploying. Till at last there comes a day when you throw your shirt away, you cast your trousers, uh, uh, cast your trousers too, if they'll only let you do, and adopt the ancient style, wearing nothing but a smile. And the guy who did it is William Webb here, and, but he's again, he's in a chair, so, you know, possibly um, his war's over, hopefully. Um, Private George, now this one, um, I think I've got over it. There was a time when I couldn't read this without crying, in fact, or having tears in my eyes. Uh, the painting is to show you the conditions of the, the winter of 1916-17. I see him in his bed and he can see the snowflakes hitting the window. I lie in bed both warm and dry and watch the snowflakes driving by. The frost on the window is forming fast, the wind howls by in an icy blast. And I think as I look at the sheets so white, God pity the boys in the line tonight. And the sad thing is that he was <laughs> made better and died in July 1917, probably third battle of the Ypres, as we know, is a passion dial. Uh, the concerts, I love Clarence Hunter Buckley. He's another, another one of my favorites. Uh, Clarence Hunter Buckley, um, it's, it's sad in a way. This is his concert, May the 3rd, 1917. <clears throat> he was, he, he, his parents were from the jewelry quarter in Birmingham. Um, and I, but I, he had been a music hall artist, so he had got some background in it. Um, you got, I love the, the Great War scene, 1964. Oh, wouldn't that have been wonderful to see? Um, you got Gilbert the Filbert, which he sings. Uh, Gilbert the Filbert, uh, the phrase for it is, um, um, he calls himself a nut, a K-N-U-T. And at the time, a nut was like a, a man about town. Uh, 
or the sands of the desert. I can imagine what that would be like. You know, oh, you know, it just it just gives you a wonderful idea of what it was like at the time. The sad bit about Clarence Hunter Buckley, I wanted him to go on and have tons and tons of children. He gets married, um, and then what happens is that, in fact, he gets married at the castle. Um, but my brother, who is he's on ancestry, did the research for me. He actually um, he dies in 1923, and you know you think. But why did he die that young? Uh, was it a case, you know, he's not counted as a war death, but the chances are he died of his injuries. <clears throat> Lance Corporal Parker was another one, uh, wonderful guy. So much so, again, he was a musical artist. Um, okay, Black Lives Matter, we would not appreciate an old time review in Darkyland. Uh, it's called Cold Box because that was the name of, of a bomb uh, that gave off this sort of black smoke. Uh, pork and beans must have been wonderful with Private, Private Walker and, and Lance Corporal Parker. Uh, <clears throat> it was so successful, it appears in the newspaper, and, um, and they actually do three shows of it. And this is the cast. Um, I love Tutty Longsocks here. <laughs> this is Private uh, Parker, or oh, Lance Corporal Parker. Um, fancy dress, this was black and he's Mr. Mistopheles, you've got the baby, you've got Ulrich, you've got uh, a Russian Cossack, you've got uh, Chaplin, Star Charlie Chaplin, you've got Pierrot, you've got Lord. And, and you think, well, where did they get the costumes from? You know, where have these costumes come from? They're in the middle of nowhere. How have they managed to get costumes like this? Uh, Walker and Taylor, um, if you know your First World War history, this they're dressed up as um old bill and his mate and old bill was a famous cartoon of the time uh, uh drawn by a guy called uh, Ben's father so you know it, it'd be readily um noticeable or uh, recognized by the the uh, the patients i've talked for too much i apologize i've got over 45 minutes but i'll give you time for questions and almost finally um, Private Henry Grander and Bishop. I saw this first and I thought he reminds me of somebody. And if you remember um, uh, da, 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 the, 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 the Durrells, probably about the Durrells, he reminded me of the actor who played the, one of the Durrells uh, in his face. And I looked at the dog and he was only on second or third inspection. I noticed that he, he, he was missing his left leg because you know, it's not immediately obvious but he's only got his right leg the dog's called bishop i wonder why they call him bishop um private wade and his family and his happy family um so feeding the the the, the ducks and again convalescence you know get them in, in touch with with animals uh, the sad thing about wade is that he like later dies he he's made better again He's not well enough to go to, into the front line. So you think well, that's fine, that's good. You know, he's not well enough. They put him in the labor corps, which is often what happened with some of the soldiers, that if they were not physically fit enough to fight in the labor corps, uh, the trouble was with the labor corps, uh, you are dealing with uh, unexploding shells and things like that. Um, and in uh, January, 1920, he dies. I don't know why he died. But he died in January 1920 while he was still in the, in the Labour Corps. Uh, this one, you know, the um, overcoming adversity uh, with Checkley and Carsley. If you look closely, one of them had been injured in his right arm and one had been injured in his left arm. But between them, they can still play the violin. <clears throat> the hospital closed on the 1st of April 1919. So it carried on for, what, six, six months after the war had ended. Uh, there's a procession in Worcester where um, the Worcester Regiment um, marched. All the BAD hospitals in Worcestershire marched as well. Big write-up in um, uh, Barrow's Worcester Journal. Um, guess what? They forgot to mention Hartlebury. And so they had to point a retraction and, or, or an apology the next week saying, I'm terribly sorry, I forgot to mention Hartlebury. Uh, but we won't. You know, I certainly will not forget Francis Gibbons, who if anything really deserved a medal 
you know, here she is not looking at the troops anymore, but just looking at the flowers in the garden. And the last word really goes to Lance Corporal H.T. Bevan, who's in 1919, he's the last patient in the book. A priceless work happily ended must always be good or be, be always good to find. Smiles come when we look behind and think of those we tended. And that's just pure publicity, just to say, if you want the book, there's my email address. It's 1495, five pounds, which is the profit of the book, goes back to the hospital trust. I'd have finished. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you so much. That was um, fascinating. And how wonderful to have all of that document.